Thank you, Nick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Luana, the co-organizer at Creative Mornings. I have a, a few volunteers and my co-organizer here with me as well, Sarah. Um, I'm very delighted to um, introduce Dana. Um, I've actually met Dana, well, I've actually attended one of her talks. She didn't really meet me at the time, um, about a year ago, and I was really impressed with um, with kind of the, the radical shift in her career, the way she was approaching things. And I was really uh, looking forward to one day inviting her at Creative Mornings. So I was really happy when this theme came up because she was the first person that came to mind. Uh, and I'm actually happy it worked out that she joined us at such a radical time. She's currently in Greece and it's about 2 a.m. So I just wanna let everyone know, thank you for joining us this morning because you know, she's making quite the effort to be here. Um, a little bit about Dana before I, uh, I start um, introducing her. She is an international mediator, a lawyer, and a negotiation trainer. Um, she founded Med8, uh, which is Excellence in Negotiation, um, promoting open communication and empathy, and has been guiding corporates and families for over 25 years, um, basically to use tools to resolve even the most critical disputes. Um, so if you have any dispute questions on negotiation, uh, she's the right person to ask. Um, I think she's uh, she's part of many initiatives, and I'd say another one that uh, really struck me was the Reaching Hearts Giving Back charity, uh, which is um, you know has the mission of supporting children to fulfill the basic needs for food, shelter, and most important, education. So she's really helping children get an education um, in Nepal especially. Um, and in her spare time, she loves to stand, do stand-up comedy, which we'll get into a little bit, um, basically with the goal of not only raising funds, but also, you know, kind of like getting into the language that we all understand, which is laughter and communicating that way. So good morning and welcome, Dana. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're really, really happy to have you here. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for uh, thinking of me. A yes, pleasure. I I'd love to start with the basic question of what does radical mean to you? How would you describe this word and, and feeling? Um, what is radical to you? Um, yeah, so I think you just said it. I think radical is a feeling. And I think it comes from a clash between the way we see life compared to what life itself brings to us. Um, it's a matter of perception because something that is radical to you will mean nothing to me and vice versa. Things that are radical to me, it's, it's a matter of what your core values are and how you how you see life yourself. So I guess, yeah, I guess that's the way I would put it. And can you can you tell us a little bit about the, you know, I've also introduced you with having a radical journey. I started without letting you introduce yourself, but I guess like the way you see it, and could you tell us a little bit about your journey when you first came to Singapore and kind of where you are today? I'd say there's quite a few steps that took you where, where you are, you know, sailing on a boat in, in Greece at the moment, <laughs> but uh, just kind of taking a step back. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the journey? Um, and how you how radical was part of it? Of course, um, I think we arrived to Singapore, um, and it was meant to be as we talked, because my husband said let's we need to move somewhere in Asia, and Singapore was chosen, and everything fell in the right place to be, and we came with two kids, and another two were born over there, um, and while they were born, the first one. I got really, um, I got really depressed after the birth, which never happened before in Israel with the other two. And this led to me to look for help. And I found this amazing healer that helped me to go back on my feet, which later on she became a source of help for me and understanding that I'm a part of something much bigger. So this belief and this, um, depending on this, huge universe for us or you name it, the creator or universe or energy around us started then. So I think the fact that I came to Singapore, yes, it was for my husband's um, job and, you know, and career, but it made me grow in a way that was very radical, you know, to be at the bottom with no family and friends and no support was a radical moment the way I saw it. My husband didn't really see it because he was busy with his own things. So thanks to that, um, 
thanks to this pregnancy, I managed to go into the, med the mediation scene in Singapore because the pregnancy was an urgency as far as I saw it. So I couldn't take a no for an answer from the mediation center. And when they said, yeah, we have a course in like seven months, and I said, not happening. And she said, I'm so sorry, but we don't have spaces. And I remember I put the phone down and said, it's not happening to me, no way. And I took my car, I drove to the Supreme Court and I opened the door and she looked at me and she said, hello. And I said, hello there. And she said, do I know you? And I said, yeah, we just spoke on the phone, I'm Dana. And she looked and she saw the belly. And I said, I'm sorry, but I can't take no for an answer. This baby will come and I will lose my mind. You have to let me in. And she looked at me, she started to laugh. And then she looked at the computer and she said, oh, you're so lucky there's one spot available and the course starts in like three days. And that what brought me to become a mediator in Singapore. And later on, you know, every thing, one thing led to another, the mediation I managed to do. A friend asked me to be a diamond dealer in Singapore and I said, okay, that cool. Let's do it. That was really funny yeah. when you told me about it. <laughs> Look at me, I'm wearing these, you know, fabric earrings. I have nothing to do with diamonds except for this admiration of this creation of nature. But they asked me to be a drug, um, not a drug dealer, sorry, a diamond dealer. Drug dealing is a different, different story. Um, and I remember I looked and said, okay, what do I do now? I went online, I Googled and said, where do you learn gemology in Singapore? And, you know, apparently again, it was meant to be. So I called the, the office and they said, yes, we have one spot left and the course starts tomorrow. I said, well, that's cool. Where is it? Like five minutes walk from my house. So everything, you know, I'm not a diamond dealer anymore, but this led to the fact that, you know, I was hoping to work in this, to make millions, to go around Singapore with this diamond case. And my friend decided to quit it and to move to a different market. And then I said, okay, if I can't do this, then I will start my own business media that you that you described that one is kind of a catalyst for you starting your own business right that's what you were telling me about something that you are not okay. gonna ever think about which is dealing diamonds took you to actually starting your mediation business right. yeah. yeah so if it wasn't for him I'm you know I might have done something else but because it didn't work and I was already in the mediation scene I said okay let's start my own business which I did and it was fantastic mediation in court and for you know individuals and companies and negotiation training etc uh, etc et um, and then I think I decided to look for more of this you know energy around me um, so I'm sure some of you are probably practicing meditation or maybe some of you practicing you know healing of some sort or just sensing things because we are all a part of this huge ball of energy and I started to join these seminars everywhere in the world you know like in Singapore a few of them and then I went to Australia and to Fiji and in one of my flights to these events the energy was so high that you know I was exploding from energy I was radiating I could, I mean, that's how I felt. and on the airplane back home I remember from Fiji I was on the airplane and I said to myself okay, I'm going on this flight, I'm by myself, I have no kids with me, nobody will ask me to blow his nose, nobody will ask me to change a diaper, no one will ask me to do this, I'm going to put everything in the luggage, I'm going to check in everything but my passport, and I'm a free woman, hooray, and then like half an hour into this flight, I had this epiphany moment, that a whole thing came to me, a whole book and I said, holy shit, now what do I do? I don't have my laptop, I don't have my notebook. I was smarty to put everything in the luggage. And then I remember I started to collect from my neighbors, you know, the vomit bags. And I wrote all the book on vomit bags. And I said, I finished after, I, mean, I think the flight attendant thought I'm obsessed because I was like, she said, would you like to have anything? I said, yes, I need more vomit bags, give it to me. And. So this was a moment that I said, what is this coming through? Like, I, I was like a channel. And I came home, I remember with the vomit bags, I put it on the table and said to my husband, I wrote a book. He looked at the vomit bags, he looked at me and said, what? I said, I'm telling you, it's a bestseller. <laughs> and look again, you know, it was, it was meant to be because in two months it was out. It was published on Amazon. 
Can you tell us a little bit about what the book was about? Just of course. For those who here, yeah. yeah. It's still there. It's um, it's a book with tons of tips and knowledge that I gathered on my, you know, on my dead body. How to fly with your kids and make it to the other side. <laughs> so, you know, it was like full of real stories that happened to us around the world. Full of tips, like activity pages at the end. I interview flight attendants. So there's like a chapter of what how they see us. You know, these annoying parents with kids asking for diapers in the middle of the flight. And I was so drawn to this that I said, okay, mediate can wait. I've done it for a while. Let's do something else. And I started to be busy with the book. Um, and it was intense two months, but I was totally emerged in that. I remember I told you we had a crew of people like you guys, you know, like I remember the lady that helped me to publish was in one side of the States and the editor was on the other side of the States. And the illustrator from Malaysia, the um, formatting guy from India, the lady who made the activity pages from Pakistan, and I was in Singapore trying to manage this orchestra. So 2 a.m. was uh, was normal then, <laughs> like now. The training. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And the book came out and became bestseller. Like I don't remember doing so much, but you know, it just it just flew. It flew. So it took you like you, you mentioned about two months to write a book or quite a quite a quite a fast turnaround for a book, I'd say. Yeah. Listen, when you are born on a vomit bags, you have to go fast. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, it disappears, right? You have to, to write everything down. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that's awesome. So then you, you were telling me about how obviously the book opened this journey because that's when I met you, right? You were telling us about the book and also raising funds um, for the children in Nepal, which I thought was was brilliant and so beautiful, like how everything was really connected and your initiatives, you know, supporting a higher cause. Um, but then you were supposed to have a book tour in 2020. So can you tell us about the radical of 2020? Because I think everyone went through a version of their own, but, you know, again, we want your version um, this morning. So yeah, so the book went well and there was a world book tour. You know, I was supposed to give um, a lecture in the States and in Japan and in Vietnam and in Israel and in Thailand and in London and in Portugal. And it was so exciting. And I was like, I said, oh my God, I'm an author. Who would have thought, you know, the kids said, mom, you're an author. And I was like, yeah. Um, and everything was planned and I you know I even I remember I even printed like hundreds of books you know to carry with me for those book launches all over the world and COVID started and everything froze everything it wasn't even frozen it, everything cancelled and I remember I was sitting at home and I said mm, well um, I guess it will be a different year I'm not going to, you know, to explode with the book all over the place. And um, I remember I even went to the States for a seminar, which the book launch was in the same city and it didn't happen because it was already, you know, like the beginning of COVID and people were already, she was worried. She said, let's wait. And I felt like someone took all the air, you know, like out of my beautiful sail. But then I said, and I remember Kate, my husband, Kedar, told me at the beginning of planning this tour, he said, do you really think this tour is going to promote you, like do something better for you as a human being? And I immediately answered, of course, it's very important. I want to be in the States and in Japan. Everybody needs to know about this book and it's going to help so many of them. And he said, okay, and that's it. And then when everything was canceled, I said, wow, Maybe it's not the right way for me to spend my energy and time. Maybe it was just an ego trip that would have been really cool to do. Everybody have a bit of ego, but there's a higher reason for this to be canceled. So I remember after not a long while, I became in peace with that. And I said, okay, the universe has a different plan to me. I let go of this one. It doesn't mean that the book doesn't exist. It means that the book is not as relevant now because people don't fly as much. So let it rest in Amazon, do something else. And when the time right, you, it will fly again. But then it will not be so much about me. It will be more about the book. So I can be more, you know, like to take a step back. 
Yeah, which is and I think when you when you were telling me about you know what happened to the book, but also I think the other situations in your life that led you to where you are today. Um, what I really liked is you told me about this art of surrendering. Um, so I don't know if you can get a little bit into that because I thought that was such an interesting view on on life and on I guess like the way we take decisions moving forward. You know, when we're at crossroads. How do we choose to surrender to something knowing that that kind of ran its course or we take it, you know, another step further pushing for it? There is a book that I would like to recommend and it's called My, uh, The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. So that's another book that I got to be introduced in this seminar that opened my mind and I read it and I couldn't stop reading it. It really changed my perception about life and I guess it came with everything else that I was doing at the time meditation and healing and understanding that yes I'm important it's me but I'm a part of such a huge circle that I should you know just chill and relax and let life take me rather than you know just make every step I know what's going to happen and this control freakness that a lot of us have and I remember after reading this story I said oh my god I'm going to start my surrender experiment and it was last September you know just be careful what you wish for because <laughs> everything started you know what I mean um so my husband decided to leave his job and we were not sure what's going to happen so he got a job in New Zealand and we were planning to go there and then COVID was about to start and everything froze so he said okay not New Zealand so let's go on a trip we wanted to go to Japan Japan closed uh, let's go to India and Nepal Boop, closed and speaking of what's meant to be, when I, went, when I went to the States, our flight was one day delayed and we were very worried um, what's gonna happen. And then bloop, they moved it two days back. You know how they play with it, right? The yeah, yeah. airline. We ended up in the States um, and we had a spare day suddenly. And guess what? The author of this book, Michael Singer, where do you think he lives? <laughs> like three hours drive from the seminar place. And I remember I looked at Kedar, Kedar looked at me and said, forget the book or uh, the book launch. We were meant to meet Michael Singer. And we went to his house and it was like a mind blowing evening. Um, so, and you know, and- you Just meet well, an author and go to their house like that. <laughs> Is it just kind of your power? Like, how do you decide? Oh, I'm gonna go. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, but that's the thing. We, we, I remember I told my husband, I said, we haven't been in the States for so long. I said, where's Michael Singer leaves? And we found out that it's three hours. We ran to the car and said, okay, let's check first. So we called them, speaking of when things supposed to happen. And I said, hey, we're just visiting the States. We have an extra day. We love Michael Singer. He changed my life. I'm surrendering here because of him. Oh, screw him. And she said, oh, really? You're very lucky. It's only today, tonight, that he's giving a talk. So oh. just come. And I remember it was, you know, like 10 a.m. at the airport and we just came. <laughs> we drove, <laughs> and we arrived. And the minute we sat down in the room, he's an amazing guy. And he's doing, you know, like guided meditation as well and talking. The minute we sat down, he has no idea who you are. You're not representing yourself. You're not saying where you are, where you're from. He started to speak about Israel. He started to speak about Israel and we are from Israel. And I was sitting there and I was looking at Kedar. Kedar looked at me and said, he was waiting for us. You know, like, and I guess it's also the way you see things. Maybe he wasn't waiting for me, but I think he was. And I don't care what he was if, or not. <laughs> it's you know the perspective, what I mean? right? And what you do with that, with the perspective you're yeah. given, yeah. Exactly. So what are the chances for us to meet him in the States three hours from there, the same day having a talk, and the minute we come, Israel is la 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 la, and I'm like, Whoa! we're in the right spot. So, yeah. But this is so about surrendering. Uh, surrendering, yes. And the things coming to you is another spectrum of the story. How you were saying, you know, when things come to you, and what do you do with them? Because you could just yeah. let them be, or you can kind of take the opportunity to the next level. Yeah, it's kind of like they're opposites, right? Like in that sense. Um, so it's interesting that you work with both that once you're so passionate and determined that you won't take no for an answer and yet on the other side you need to learn how to surrender when things don't go your way so how do you balance that how do you decide that 
um, like, are you a person that really follows their gut feeling? Like, how do you kind of take a decision like that? When to surrender, when to go all in for it, determination wise. The way, the way he puts it in his book, which I'm trying to make my mantra is that whatever comes in your door, just accept it. If someone comes to visit you and you don't like them, let them in. There's a reason for them to arrive. If there is a job opportunity that is chasing you, try to take it. There's probably a lesson there or, you know, it will take you to your next level. It's making you a better person and reaching your potential somewhere. So being persistent is something healthy, I think, because then you feel loyal to yourself that whatever you want to make, you make. But if you keep getting resistant, 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 let go. Don't fall in love with your own idea, with your own plan, with your own agenda. If it's supposed to happen, the universe forces, as far as I believe, will support you, will bring you the right people like they brought to my book, will bring you the right opportunities, will bring you the right, you know, the right things for you to succeed. And if it's the opposite, it means that you're not on your path. So let go of it. Don't be, I mean, no need to be too sad and to grieve too much and to say, okay, this is not the right thing at the moment. You never know what's going to happen in the future change a small angle, it will shift so far differently. You know, if you move one angle, it still takes you there instead of there. So it's worth listening to, to your gut feeling because this is where your real brain is, is about. And it's really important, I think it's a practice to look at signs, you know what I mean? Like if you get signs or phone calls or a, a text, that you read or music that you listen to or people that you acknowledge it and then suddenly you see that wow someone is playing with me and I love this game it's a game life is a game so it depends how you look at it but if you embrace those signals and you embrace those clues then you are you're winning the game you're yeah. winning it maybe yeah. not the way you thought you're going to win it but you're on the right path or your life are your life is smooth smoother than you thought I think. And this takes me to kind of like the, the last leg of like 2020 for you. So tell us where you are right now and what are you up to? Because I think that's another uh, awesome story uh, of being on a, on a boat in Greece at the moment. So you see, it's also a part of my surrounding experiment. And that's the part that I said, oh my God, screw <laughs> you with your surrounding, what have I wished for? But the minute we started, um, we decided to leave Singapore and my husband said, he's, you know, he announced that he's quitting his job, blah, 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 blah. So we thought New Zealand is going to work. And then we thought Italy is going to work and Israel is going to work and nothing worked. And, you know, I'm living in my dream that everything will be fine because things will fall, you know, in the right place. And my husband is like, what's going to happen with your four kids and need money? Da, da, da. And then I said, look, if we can't go to Israel yet, because um, he wanted to wait until 2021. I said, how about we go on a trip for a few months and see how it goes? And he said, a trip, and I need to get a job. And I said, you don't really need to get a job. You know, we've worked hard until now. We can take a pause, like a sabbatical and go and travel. So New Zealand closed and Japan closed. And, you know, as I said, India and Nepal closed. These were my, you know, main focus. And I said, okay, so where do we go? Where is one place that they have to let us in? And said, okay, it's Europe, because you all have European passport, but me, hopefully they will have some mercy and will let me in because I'm married to you. And as the universe plays with you, you know, sometimes it's like hide and seek. I got my passport three days before we left Singapore. Three days. It was like nerve breaking, like, oh, am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? And I got it. Um, and we said, okay, where do we go? I said, let's go to Greece because it's big enough and isolated enough. We can find an island and just, you know, just disconnect if we need to because of COVID. And we said, okay, how are we going to move from island to island? I said, let's take a boat. And my husband looks at me and that's his dream. His dream is to travel the world with a boat with us, totally ignoring the fact that I'm getting seasick like big time. And I said, he looked at me, you wanna be on a boat? I said, look, we're gonna be on a boat. It will be fine, I'll manage. And I said, okay, let's see how it goes. And the right boat arrived, uh, you know, like two months before we came, somebody told us, yes, there is a right boat for you. It will wait for you in Athens. We came to Athens, we found a house for two weeks in case we need to be quarantined and we started sailing. And 
my husband knows how to sail, but never sailed a catamaran. This is like big guys. I'm telling you, I've never been on, on a catamaran like this. We never slept on a catamaran. Mm -hmm. But again, things work. You know, he called someone to come and be our skipper. So we had a skipper for one week to learn about the boat. And then he managed to, managed to do it like this, that the next person who is the instructor and the one who's supposed to see if you, if you can do it to give you the certificate, Kay was supposed to come just the day after. And then he called us and said, guys, I'm sorry, I can't make it on Friday. I will come on Monday. And we said, oh shit, now what are we going to do four days alone on the boat? I was scared. I said to Keda, no matter what, we're going to be in a marina. I don't want to move the boat alone without him. And you know what happened on those four days? My brother called from Israel and told us he's coming to get married in Greece. And they said it's going to happen on this specific Friday. And I said, oh, okay. So this is why the reason he couldn't make it. And we had a weekend of wedding suddenly out of, out of the blue. Um, it was a blast. And we had a four day wedding. And then the instructor came and we went sailing and we've been sailing since then. It's crazy. <laughs> Just crazy. So, so a lot of things that took you to, to today, like a lot of the different journeys, if, even just what you shared with us today, and I'm sure there's more, feels quite, quite, everything's quite different, right? But it's all facets of who you are and they're kind of like there within you and you choose, okay, let me bring this out and let me bring this out now, like the Kataraman, the, the writer, the, you know, things that you never thought about probably, right? Never, never. It's like, you know, it's like putting, I don't know, like a, a donkey on a boat. My element is, is ground. I'm, I'm, I'm in the forest, <laughs> but suddenly they've shaken my world so big and I have no one to blame. You know how bad it is because I suggested it. So yes. I could complain. I have no one to blame. I need to cope with it. Not, not only that, they made me second in command. Do you know what that means? I need no, to tell us about that. Yeah. <laughs> what do you have to do? <laughs> second in command, like what the hell? I need to understand the boat the motor. I need to be able to collect my husband if he falls in the water. It's called man overboard. I told him, dude, if you're going in the water, you are screwed. I'm not going to pick you up. I don't know how to reverse this thing. So it's super radical. Uh, and you know, again, it's radical to me because it's all new to me. And I made a decision. And you know, when there was a storm one night, I thought I'm going to die. I really thought I'm going to die. But for my husband, it's not radical at all. He's been on the ocean before. He's been in storms before. He said, just chill. We're going to put the motor. We'll be fine. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. we're going to be <laughs> fine. We're going to, we're going to clash. In the... And I made a drama. But again, radical is a perspective. Because for me, I thought I'm going to die. And he thought I'm going to lose it. But he was laughing. He wasn't getting stressed, which is a big deal. A nice um, balance. <laughs> keep keep nice balance. Up. Yes. Oh my God. Oh my God. Listen, they tell you to do new things in order to stimulate your brain, right? To go outside of your comfort zone. I tell you guys, go on a boat like my brain is exploding. <laughs> Just exploding. Oh, thank you so much, Dana. This is this has been at least at least for me a very uplifting morning. Uh, you know, when you think of radical, you you might not think of all these uh, funny anecdotes, and you know, because I guess it's not all funny, because all the things um, that led you to today were you know quite different. Um, and I want to thank you for joining us at this time because yeah, I was really grateful when I when I emailed you and I, I thought oh oh wow she's not going to respond, but then I said you know but the the theme is radical. If I remember her from her talk, she will be all for this. And you are. And I was really happy that, you know, that that aligned for me, at least <laughs> for me and Creative Mornings. Um, I would love to take some questions from the audience, uh, whether you guys want to unmute yourself and ask them or you can just put them in the chat. Um, and then the lucky person who's asking the nicest question will get um, a gift from Creative Mornings. Our, Create a Mornings Manifesto, uh, which is something that we really stand um, behind. But again, thank you, Dana. Um, I think that's, thank you You're for welcome. joining us today. Um, and then let's see if you have, we have some questions from the audience. Yeah, it's uh, Michael Groll calling from Perth. I come to Singapore sometimes to do coaching. We haven't been there for ages. Uh, so Dana, I really liked listening to you. I, I wanna ask you a very practical question. Um, sounds to me like you love learning and you're also sounds like you're someone who can connect a lot of things and put them together seamlessly uh, from a practical perspective. Um, 
how do you ask for stuff? Like you talk about asking the universe, but when you're uh, asking for Michael Singer, what's your approach to asking for things? Oh, it's a good question, dude. So hello there, Ozzy. Um, so I think like, it's a good question. The thing is like that, I think whatever you want, you should ask for, but don't fall in love with the idea of getting it. So if you wish to, I don't know, I wanna get this job, I wanna get this job, yes. Pray, meditate, see yourself in the job, already imagine yourself there. I really believe in the power of us creating our own reality. Yet, if it doesn't work, it's not something against you. It's something for you. You might not see it now, you might see it later, but surrender and accept the fact that if it doesn't work, maybe there's a higher reason for it. You can try, be persistent, try every avenue, but if it doesn't go smooth, it was not meant to be probably. And um, I get it from a few friends of mine and they said, but how do you know what to ask for? A lot of people just don't ask because they don't know what. So if you know what to ask, you're very lucky. And I said, if you don't know what to ask for, ask that, what should I ask for? So it's okay when you practice to ask, what should I ask for? And you will be guided by whether it's your uh, guidance, you know, like spiritual guidance or whether it's the universe, your energy, whatever you believe in, but you will get a sign, you will get a clue, you will get um, a direction. Thank I you, Michael. Help. It's a brave one um, to add to put your camera on. Thank you, but I think you're you've been the you've been an organizer at Creative Mornings as well, so <laughs> you're you're versed into this, and and we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, anyone else has any other questions for Dana? Um, there's one for. Would you like would you like to go ahead and ask Dana your question? You can you can go ahead. I won't read it. Oh, yeah. So I think I had a bit of typos there, but like what questions as, as a mediator, <clears throat> what questions would you ask to get a deeper, re, uh, deeper understanding and go deeper into the issue to get a positive result from mediation? Good one as well. Well done. It's a simple question that people usually don't ask. Um, and what I ask the sides, the disputants that are coming to mediation in order to get their deeper understanding is I ask, what do they want? They usually don't tell you what they want. They tell you what happened, how they feel about it, why it's wrong, why it's right, but they never stop to tell you what they want. When you ask someone, what do you need? They literally come up with the true needs and issues that are sitting on their souls. And then you can map and see what's in common ground between them and then working on the common ground, which is another question that nobody usually asks. You know, usually ask, what do you disagree? What is the topic of the dispute? But when you ask what do you have in common, suddenly you put them in a positive perspective to look at the issue in a different glasses. So these two questions usually bring up a lot of, a lot of information. Go for it, try it. <laughs> All right, thank you. You're welcome. We have one more, thank you, Nick. We have one more question from Tista. Um, any tips to, come, to overcome the feeling uh, or sense of doom when asking tough questions? Again, please. So any, any tips to overcome the feeling of, of sense of doom? So like when you feel uneasy, when you ask tough questions, like do you have any, um, yeah, any advice on how to overcome that? Like kind of like, you know, when you when you have to ask a really hard question and it's it's really hard to put it out there. So that's one struggle, I would assume, interpreting what Batista's saying. Yeah. Um, but then like how do you overcome yeah that feeling and asking it and go for it basically? I am so good. It's a fantastic question. The whole point of asking questions usually is to get information and to move forward. I think, I assume. Therefore, before you ask the question, if you focus on what you want to get out of it, if you focus on the outcome, if you focus on the progress, if you focus on, you know what, when I'm asking this damn question, I'll get it off my chest. When you are concentrating the results and what you're going to gain out of it, it makes it easier because the question serves the purpose. It's not the question that is the topic anymore. The journey is the topic. 
So what is going to bring me from, one, from point A to point B? Asking this question, talking this, this, to this person, writing this email and taking a shower, whatever. So once you see it as a tool, you don't put so much weight on it, I think. So it makes it easier to, to go with it. Yeah. And we are only human. Even if you made a mistake or you, you hurt, oops, the little one woke up one minute. Okay, gone. Um, moved from one room to another. And uh, that's the benefit of a boat, you know, it's like two meters from one room to another. Um, so I think, yeah, when you focus on the outcome and what you want to achieve, and also you remember that you're just human. So even if you ask it in a wrong way and someone got hurt, if you had positive intent, <laughs> it, would go, it would go okay because you're coming from a good place and you won't hurt anyone deeply because you really mean well by asking it. And if you don't, then reframe the question. Thank you for I the question. Thanks. Thank you, Dana, for your answer. And we have one more. Um, what are some of the rituals that you practice to embrace being radical in times of uncertainty? Yeah, what do I practice? Um, first of all, I'm, I learned healing. So by learning healing, I'm doing a different meditation, but I guess doing meditation is really helpful. And I know everybody's speaking about meditation and how cool it is. And then people that are not doing it are overwhelmed. Like, how do I start? What do I do? And I was the same. So for me, the healing gave me a way. I'm just connecting and I'll tell you in a minute how I do it. But I think doing meditation really works the, you know, the chemicals in your brain and really calms you down and makes you focus on breathing. So usually when we are stressed and we are in uncertainty and we have fear controlling our body, we are not breathing deeply. So I do practice meditation that there are so many beautiful apps up, out there that you can try and reconnect to this because you had it as a child, as children, we do it naturally. And you can do five to 10 min uh, minutes of meditation every day. And after a month, it becomes a habit and you can't live without it. It's beautiful because it gives you this peace of mind, 10 minutes that's worth like an hour or two. I do a lot of uh, breathing exercise. I start my morning routine when I'm not too freezing, you know, like in Greece, it's freezing now. I do breathing routines. I deep really deep. I breathe really deep to oxygenate, you say, my body and to energize myself. And I started to do exposure to cold, which sounds cuckoo and it is cuckoo. Um, but there's a guy called Wim Hof that we started to follow a few months ago, speaking of also in Singapore. And he's speaking about that the breathing technique plus the exposure to cold really calms you down, calms your mind, calms your inner voice and calms your body. And I found it tremendous. So anything from meditation to yoga, I do yoga as well, um, to this cold exposure, if you wanna be radical with your body a bit, it's good for you, it can really help. And, um, what I do, just to give you an example that is really easy to try and do yourself, I'm closing my eyes and I do it with my kids. So I'm not sure how many of you are older than not having kids, but um, it works well for you, it works well for them. You close your eyes, it doesn't matter if you sit or you lie down and you're imagining this ball of light coming to you. And this ball of light, you know, our imagination is super strong. So it doesn't matter if it takes you 30 seconds to reach this ball of light or two and a half minutes, screw the rules, there are no rules. The minute the ball of light come to you, it can be as tiny as an apple or as huge as the universe, who cares? You pay attention to the color because the color usually represents, you know, the area of your body that needs more energy, you know, like the chakras. You can read in Google, it's easy. And then you ask this ball of light to come to your head to tickle, tickle, tickle and go inside and then you know, fill with light all your body. And it's like a guided imagination, you know, drill, but it works magic because once you connect it to this ball of light, if you have a pain in your ear, you're sending to your ear, it washes, you know, everything out, the bad bacteria, and you keep going. The first step is to believe that it's possible. So give it a try. What do you have to lose? Try this ball of light. It's highly, highly powerful. Thank you, Dana. 
And um, I'll take the last question where it's more like a, a question based on one of your answers. Um, so I think this relates to, you know, when you choose not to fall in love with your idea, um, when you kind of choose to surrender, basically, um, isn't this leading to a lack of confidence that you're going to achieve your goal in the first place? So isn't that taking you away from your confidence um, in achieving your goal? If you decide to surrender or to choose not to fall in love with your idea. Okay, so that's exactly the point. First of all, if you choose, it means that you're in control. Yeah, we always have a choice um, whether to do A or B. Even if the situation is really shitty, what do I do? Do I feel sorry for myself? Do I overcome? Do I do this first and then overcome? Do I talk to someone or do I go for a run? Once you choose to do it, you're already in control. So there is no, no need to lose your confidence. You're going on a track, you're doing an action. It doesn't work very well. Do I persist? If I make a choice to persist, I will persist with full power. If I get good results, it will give me more confidence that I'm on the right direction. But if I'm getting no, 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 then I'm losing my confidence. If I keep going blindly towards something that's not supposed to happen, so if I stop and I look at the reality in the face and said, what's going on? Why nothing happens the way I want it to happen? Maybe I'm just on the wrong path. I'm not wrong. I'm amazing. I'm like, you know, skillful. I'm grateful. I'm talented. I'm ambitious. I'm just on the wrong path. So if I stop and surrender, then the right path will reveal itself and the confidence will only grow. And all the, the, also the confidence, I think maybe I will make it a bit sharper. The confidence in the universe is something super powerful because you're not depending only on yourself. So if, if you believe there is God, there is a creator, there is something bigger than us, when you put your confidence in this and you understand that you're just one way of making it happen, then the confidence is super comforting because it's much bigger than just us you know, taking care of ourselves, we are a part of something much bigger. So I think it allows you to feel empowered to make choices that are not the easy ones, but it will show you and prove you that you've done right to give you the confidence to do it again in the future. But you need to trust the process, I agree. Faith and trust are highly connected to surrounding and radical situation, highly connected, I agree. Thank you, Dana. So these are all the questions for today. Uh, I think it's been great. Even the part with the questions revealed so much, at least for me, um, you know, learning from you this morning. So thank you. Um, and now I'll ask you to choose a winner and then we will proceed to take a photo, all of us, <laughs> before oh we close Creative Mornings this morning. So if you remember any of the questions or um, if you think that was, you know, a really good question, who would you um, gift the manifesto to? Oh my God, oh my God, you put me in the judge position in 2.30 a.m., oh my God. <laughs> but I think um, um, I loved all the questions, to be honest, not because I want to be nice to all of you, but I think the last question, uh, also because I remember it the best, but also I think this is the meaning of what we talked the whole evening. So the last question that you just asked me. Okay, Lavinia this, thing, the choosing not to fall in love with your idea, is that the one? The one to, what, what do you do? How do you let go and not losing your confidence? Yes, I yes. think this is, the key. this is the key to our existence. Understanding that we are, we, we have someone to trust and you name it the way you want it. I don't really care. Uh, that's the real practice. And that's the real, the real power and the real struggle. So if you practice this and you have faith and you have trust in the process, you are already on the right path seeking for it and then you'll get there yeah so I think this is like um a key a key thing to understand and to practice and to feel yeah in order to yeah okay great so congratulations Lavinia will um if you could please uh dm us your detail at the creative mornings instagram maybe it's the easiest way and then we'll send it through and then if everyone um is still open um no everyone's transitioning to their work day to put their cameras on for a quick photo with our speaker. We'd love to have that um, as a testament of the day. Uh, so, oh, Lavin another friend of mine, I see Lavinia out for a run with dogs. That's so nice. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Awesome.
Okay, so um, I will take a photo. One, two, three, you'll hear a, you'll hear a buzzing for me. Thank you, awesome. And I'll look at the second page as well. We have a few people. Great, thank you everyone for joining this morning. And um, we will be coming up with more details for our last talk of the year in 2020 in December on the theme of biophilia. But until then, um, I guess there's uh, a beauty in staying radical in our own way. So again, thanks Dana and thank you for everyone joining this morning. Thanks Bye. for having me. Have a beautiful day. I'm going to sleep. Go sleep. <laughs> Good night, Dana. Bye, everyone. Thanks for that. Ciao.